thanks, Jens. No, we're all done. I uh, thank you. Uh, that was an amazing uh, lecture by John Dymar. I was yeah. taken aback by how much he covered in such a short time. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a challenging task to go over, but I'll do my best. Um, so, MIS deformity surgery. You know what what does this really mean? What are we really doing? Um, so this is kind of a typical case for us. So this is a T9 to pelvis MIS. We've used a four-level MIS T-lift, per pedicle screws, percoliac screws, uh, facet fusion, or time here. It's probably a little bit longer than a typical open surgery. I see Vince Arlay there. He's faster than me. Blood loss, very reasonable. Length of stay, though, very short. So um, if you look at the publications, you'll find that there really has been a growth, and this is dated to 2018, 251. There's probably about 500 publications now on MIS deformity. What you've seen is that this is a growth area. So for the young surgeons out there, if you're interested in your career, this is taking uh, some foothold now into the reality of what we're doing for surgical intervention. And so why the interest, right? So why, why are we even talking about this? Because if we look at deformity surgery, in many ways, it represents the K2, the Mount Everest of what we do, which is that it's the most complicated, most challenging, highest risk, most expensive type of surgery we do. So if we could do that better, we would have the best benefit to our patients, right? And we're seeing this. We're seeing that in the United States, this is a paper by Rick Dale, looking at the complexity of spine surgery, increasing number of levels, type of fusion, number of fusions, everything is on the increase. Well, partly because our patients are older and sicker and have more disorders, right? But when you look at deformity surgery, this is what you find. When you type into Google, it completes you. It completes your ideas and thoughts. And this is what you get when you type in scoliosis surgery. And here you can see this uh, lady, Jill Welsh, has this post about how she's a spine fusion survivor. It's almost like they treat it as if you were diagnosed with cancer, right? So, you know, there is this thing, right, about what we're doing and how much risk there is. This is a nice paper by uh, Chopin's group looking at, uh, at, I'm sorry, looking at the risk of um, of scoliosis surgery. And, you know, we, we've demonstrated a lot of things that we can reduce cost, we can prevent PJK, we can uh, have better clinical improvement, we can have coronal correction, and now we can have sagittal correction. So what what is, what is Jens asking us, right? Why are we not seeing more of this type of surgery, right? So this is, to me, the first documented MIS deformity case by Greg Anderson. I'm sure there was one earlier than this, but you can see that this is what we would call a Hollywood curve. This is back in 2005. At the time, the the, the idea was that this was a contraindication to MIS surgery because of the rotation, because of the malalignment, right? So this is the first documented case that I'm aware of, right? And of course, the big revolution came with lateral surgery from Luis Pimenta and the, the birth of the x -lift. And you can see the growth and proliferation of this type of surgery really has been phenomenal. Uh, this is what a lot of the young surgeons really want to learn. I know Rod Eskewing is an expert in this in the world. People travel long distances just to have him do the surgery, right? So this is a typical kind of you know, three-level lateral with percutaneous screw type of surgery. And you can see that there are some limitations. If you're going to go truly percutaneous, minimally invasive, you're not going to as easily do these bigger surgeries unless you incorporate other techniques, right? So, you know, things with the lateral surgery, of course, you know, people are trying to conquer this with prone lateral, single position lateral, but the amount of time. Two position surgery, uh, there are rigid spinal levels that are hard to treat. It's hard to get sagittal balance. And this is a paper by Rick Fessler that looked at this, that, you know, you cannot get regional or global sagittal realignment with just doing lateral surgery. Now, this paper is dated because we know now that things have changed. There are procedures like the anterior column resection and the O-lift that allow us to get tremendous leverage uh, as long as the motion segment is still mobile. So if you have an immobile segment, you still have to go to a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, which I'll come back to later, but cutting the ALL gives this advantage. And this is from one of, uh, one of uh, Juan's papers just showing that. Um, <clears throat> here is his uh classification scheme of osteotomies. Uh, he took the Schwab system and modified it. So there's an MIS approach, if you will, to all these five grades of osteotomies culminating with a, a VCR type of approach, so an analogous homologous sort of a setup to the Schwab classification, but now with MIS, right? So here's an example. So this is not all MIS, but here's an example of a patient who came from very far, about uh, 800 miles away to have surgery who had this previous fusion and has basically broken off above and is sagittally embedded. So how would you get at this? There's a lot of different ways, but the ACR coming from lateral here, you can see intraoperative imaging where we are going to cut the ALL, cut this, cut the contra contralateral annulus, and be able to, you can see the sizers going across at the contralateral annulus here, working through a little retractor. You can see it there, spacer. 
and then uh, getting uh, your cage in and then cutting, you can cut the ALL before, after the cage. These cages just, you know, have to be pinned into position otherwise or screwed into position. Otherwise they can migrate. They'll fish mouth out right out the front. So here you see the cutting of the ALL after the cage is in. Most people cut before the cage goes in. So it's a 10 blade going in, in front of the cage, cutting the ALL uh, and dividing it. And then you don't have to cut the whole ALL, just to the equator and you can get a tremendous amount of correction. You can see the, the amount of correction we can get just by doing uh, two levels here in this case of getting that done, a uh, really substantial amount of correction in that manner, right? But you know, that's still a pretty significant surgery. Are there other ways to do this? I, I was talking about the MIST lift approach. One of the ways we get at this is to do a mini opening here. You can see we've opened a little bit of the spine, but only on one side. The idea being if you only open a little of one side, it's kind of like if you do a Taylor tractor, you can actually get the patient up very quickly after surgery. They don't have a lot of pain if it's a unilateral, heated unilateral exposure. And this allowed us to very quickly take off the facets with osteotomy. So this is not a laminectomy. This is a four level facet joint osteotomy. Unilateral lateral. Here's what it looks like uh, through the microscope and you've taken the facets off. That takes about 20 minutes. Vince could do it in 10. Um, and then inner body approach. So four level inner body for T-lift, usually L2 to S1 to get that done. Uh, expandable cages internally and building the ship in the bottle, truly building that ship inside the bottle. This is from the cover of JNS Spine, just showing how that kind of looks in diagram, opening it up. And again, it's mini open, right? So it's not totally percutaneous, but you can get tremendous correction. And then the percutaneous screws, iliosacral screws, and you can do rod derotation and rod manipulation uh, selectively here. And you get this kind of, kind of approach that's done in about three and a half to four and a half hours uh, and get a lot of work done through this modification of a very traditional technique. Uh, and more importantly, the first demonstration of sagittal recorrection in MIS surgery was done using this approach before ACR was really invented. Um, and most importantly, like I said, if you do this, you can get people up very quickly. This is uh, someone getting up is going to walk the day after surgery, right? So you can look this up. I don't want to, we don't have time to go over this, belabor the point of this is the first initial publication I had. And it talks a lot about fractional curves and how we approach that through MIS. Uh, and uh, just in the interest of time, we, tr we started to get smarter about crossing two junctions, how you get across two junctions with uh, percutaneous rod passage. So you can go a TL spine to lumbosacral spine onto iliac screws, offsets by bending without using an offset connector. All these little uh, kitschy little techniques of how we do this better and better, but the key principles have to remain. In other words, you have to avoid hardware prominence. You can't say, well, just because it's MIS, I can't see the screw head, so the screw heads can be proud. You have to think a lot more with the MIS surgery here. We've recessed the screw heads first doing the osteotomy before the screw goes in, of course, to the ilium. And this kind of shows what that looks like. I showed this picture at the very, very beginning. Again, sagittal rebalancing being absolutely critical uh, as, a, as a goal and a strategy here. And here, this montage kind of shows how it goes, so we can bring the screws to the rods. And this is, uh, if the spine is mobile, we can get that done very efficiently. In some cases, not so easy if the bone is osteoporotic and the spine is very rigid. So we needed other more powerful techniques like MIS-PSO. Here's an example. First case we ever did, uh, very, very severe stenosis on an 82-year-old. This case is now uh, quite old. Uh, and we, we were doing open skin incisions then, no fascial opening except for the PSO site. So think of the opening for like a one or two level fusion, something along those lines and uh, doing the MIS T-lift below. So we're T-lifting below the PSO. We're doing the PSO at site. Here you can see a decancellation osteotomy, however you'd like to do your PSO. You get control because you have that area open, so it's mini open again, but you're taking a PSO surgery and turning it into the opening, if you will. And, um, it's more than that, but the opening is like a one or two level fusion. And this is the first case we ever did. So you can see your opening is a little bit bigger, right? We've gotten much smaller with this, but this gives you control over the PSO site, which you absolutely need. Um, then we're gonna use uh, fixation because you need to be able to control the translation and the angulation. So we're going to use an old technique uh, by Chopin, which is the four rod method. These are all percutaneous screws and rods. They go in with uh, dual rods. So two above, two below. You can see here we pre-bent them in preparation and the rods will connect with dominoes or wedding bands in the middle. They'll come in through the opening efficiently merging here in the center uh, where we have the small opening to connect those four rods in the exposed area of the PSO. And in this manner, you can leverage the uh, rod cantilever method so that you make the three or four or five levels above 
into one unit so you don't have to worry as much about osteoporosis screw pull out like you saw with that MIS technique where we bring the screws to the rod. This is very different. We make the rods move and we bring the rods to the rod. So this shows what it looks like breaking the PSO site uh, with those four rods in your hands. Um, and you can do coronal translation as well. Here you see me doing it in person. Again, this first case we ever did, just crushing the, the, the PSO site. But you're looking too, so you can control the fecal sac and all of that, right? So this is what that case looks like. This is this this case is now 13 years old. Guy's still alive. He's 95, I think. He comes to my clinic every year just to say hello and show me how well he's doing. Everything's looking very good there. Uh, this is him. At, this is me, a younger me. This is about three years out of surgery. Um, but, you know, this this just shows examples of how that can be done. MISPSO uh, and, um, you know, all these different techniques still require a good bit of skill to get the job done, uh, but definitely a lot less blood loss, a lot less uh, muscle exposure. This is a very extreme case. When I look back at this case now, I think, you know, like, that, you know, it's a great coronal correction, but sadly, I probably should have done like a two-level PSO or a lift at one level. You know, this is this this case is also about 11 years old now, right? So this is, the, I'm just showing you old cases. And the technical outcomes, again, you can read about this, it's been published in Journal of Neurosurgery Spine, and uh, you can get an idea of how we do that. So this kind of shows that the, the, the grid of how you do this. Uh, we, we, you have old hardware. You always got to open some part of it just to connect on or deal with the old hardware. And, you know, a lot of credit goes to MIS ISSG. This is uh, this is the minimally invasive algorithm. Praveen Mumanini is now in his third iteration of the MIS DEF, MIS deformity algorithm. And uh, it, take a look. Again, not enough time. We could spend two hours just going over ISSG data with the MIS group. And it uh, really been a, a fun trip with all those guys. Everybody does slightly different techniques. This shows the MIS DEF. F1, MISF2, and MISF3 is coming out shortly, uh, and it deals with inner body and expandable cage placement. So a lot of exciting stuff going on. The big difference in class uh, three for the new MISF2 is the ACR and MISPSO. Those are the, the really big additions, right? And I think, you know, I, I will probably stop. Uh, let me just let me just fast forward there. I just want to, I don't want to take up too much time from Vince. I just want to finish with a thought, right? Um, this is about MIS sagittal correction, but, but I want to finish with a thought where we're going with this. And, and Jens brought up the important point of what we do with this. The idea is to do a lot less. And so if you think about what we are able to achieve now with MIS T-Lift, the idea is we can now get sagittal correction. We can do the, all these things that we couldn't do just five or six years ago easily uh, through different techniques, including with the awake fusion endoscopically. And so think about it this way. Like if you if you thought about this is an MIS awake T-Lift, um, it's not a huge deformity, three-level MIS T-Lift, um, but you can see that we've come a long ways in what we can do now. And I want you to think about what if one day we could correct everything uh, endoscopically, but sequentially. And we've worked on that, endoscopically dividing the ALL, getting all this done uh, without general anesthesia. And then what if we could build the systems modularly inside the body through modularized implant systems? So with that, I'm going to try to finish as early as I can. But again, congratulations to Rod and, and Jens for organizing yet another amazing uh, master's course. Take care. Enjoy. Happy Father's Day. Hey, Mike. Um, that was an excellent talk. Um, I just have a couple questions on your current deformity technique. So um, uh, for these longer cases with poor bone quality, um, how much do you use uh, fenestrated screws? And then how are you able to, do you make one incision or do you make multiple incisions? And then um, what are you using for inner bodies? Are you still uh, using titanium um, or uh, autographed? Um, what, are, what are some of the techniques that you're doing currently? Yeah, I mean, you know, we do use fenestrated screws sometimes. We have a very old, very mm -hmm. osteoporotic population, so we, we often will use that. It's a big advantage to be able to do that efficiently, put the screw in first, then inject the cement. You're absolutely right. For inner body, we do, for anterior and lateral, uh, we use, you know, the same kind of cages you use. I don't like a lot of titanium. My patients are so osteoporotic. I like yeah. to use carbon fiber or peak. For posterior, we do rely very heavily on spinology because it creates uh, inner body expansion that's tremendously powerful, like hydraulic jacks. So, um, but it's evolving, right, Rod? Yeah. I, mean, I know that you've been pushing the envelope every day. So. Yeah. No, great talk. Thanks again, Mike. Great to see you. All right. Take care. See you soon. Our next speaker is Dr. Arlay.